All right, because of the great lapse of time, it's almost impossible to locate the original seat of the old Ethiopian empire. Yeah, you know what it is. What's going on? You listen to King Cam on Jumbe Podcast and Jumbe Me's message, and we're going to get right into the business. Uh, yeah, we're getting into chapter two, the old Ethiopia and its people. Old Ethiopia and its people. All right, this is an introduction to African history geared just for you, designed to foster a life of learning. And, of course, it it will be once a week. Uh, shout out to the fam. Once a week, go over, we'll go over a few readings on the continent. Are there any other civilizations in Africa outside of Kemet? And right now, we're dealing with Kush, the Sudan. Much love to the, uh, to the people of Sudan, uh, North and South. All right, let's get it. All right, we're going to deal with ancient Kush. Okay, the empire of Kush. We we highlight a lot dealing with Kemet and Egypt and everything the uh, from the dynastic period and so and so on. But there's some so many other things that we can discuss. So many other topics we can discuss. And I chose to go further south. I chose to go southward, uh, where the seat of power is. You can you can agree, you can disagree. Let's argue, but it is what it is. Ancient Kush. The book we're coming out of, this is our test book for summer school. All right. The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushai Empire by Sister Drusilla Houston. This was written almost 100 years ago, 100 years ago. So some of the things are dated, but I think that uh, it's very relevant. I think it's relevant. And it's a good start. It's a good start for your journey. OK, it's a short read, but it's a good read. Let's go. And the link is in the description. As an Amazon affiliate, I earn from qualifying purchases. Check it out. Get you one. While, while there's a few that's still on the cheap. Okay? Because after that, it kind of goes up. All right? Let's go. All right. Essential question for today. How does Houston define the geographical boundaries of the ancient Kushite Empire? Um, we have to understand that these are not state lines as they are drawn. Wherever the Nile River went, that's where they went. But let's talk about it. Number two, what were the significant political and cultural influences of the Kushite Empire? Okay, we always focus on Egypt and Kemet being a seat of power, political power, cultural power, but Kush had the same amount of power. All right, how did the Kushite Empire interact with neighboring civilizations? Let's talk about it. And we, we I had to... Re rewind this one, evidence presented. Ethiopia, the gods and goddesses of the Greeks and Romans were but kings and queens of this Kushite empire of the Ethiopians. That was massive because Homer, the Iliad, and many of uh, those many Greek and Roman stories refer to Ethiopia uh, as being the great ones, the ancient ones. The Zungu, the Europeans, had uh they gave their props they gave their respect to africa all right so so marvelous had been their achievements in the primitive ages that their latter days in their latter days they became worshipped as immortals by the people of india egypt ethiopia our legends became legendary these were ordinary people that did great so great and wonderful things to the point to where hey bro we're going to continue to tell their story. What is your story that you want the world to say? That you want your children to tell? Think about it. Go ahead. Let me know. What is the story? Was it that you got your family out of a bind? That you were the first to get a, uh, get a college education? What is it? Let me know. All right. Let's go. Because once again, because of the great lapse of time, it is almost impossible for the original seat of the old empire uh, to locate it. OK, it's almost impossible. That's how old the Ethiopian empire really is. You know, in Greece and Rome, we can say this date was here and that date was there and this happened. We don't know when. We just know over 20,000 years ago, Ethiopia was in power. And that's on record that they were a high culture, that they were a civilization. All right. Let's go. All right. 
toward the rich luxur luxuriance of this region. They looked for the Garden of Eden. It was not in Mesopotamia. It was not, say, in the, in the European version of this, this concept. I know in biblical stories, they would look towards Europe and the Middle East for it. But in ancient times, uh, a paradise or the Garden of Eden was seen as in Africa, as a place in Africa and nowhere else. All right? Yes. Uh, there, there's information in the Bible that we can lean on. Okay? But outside of that, historical facts, historical information points that Africa, uh, I'm not saying that Africa is the Garden of Eden. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is places in Africa can be seen as a paradise. All right? And they and they really look, man, they look for it. Think about it. They were looking for a cat named Preston John. I'm certain they were looking for the Garden of Eden in Africa also. All right? Anyway, let's go. For the people of the Upper Nile arose the oldest tradition and rights from them sprang the first colonies of arts and antiquity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 a, I'm gonna say it. Pictures don't lie, people do. As you notice, our sister here, she is in Ethiopia. She's in Ethiopia. Okay. But that culture is African culture. All right. As you notice, this is uh a set wearing the same horns and crowns of a cow. A cow is very fertile, it provides life, it provides a lot of things. And so our African people love. Uh, agriculture so they give due reverence and due respect to the cow but also notice the child okay there is a image of a set and the child the mother and child all right so from these people up and out arose the oldest traditions and the oldest rites rites of passage be it at birth be it in life and in death everything uh revolves some kind of rite of passage some kind of a process. You just couldn't just become who you were supposed to become without a process. Think about your life. You know, if anything that's worth doing and worth doing well requires a process. Okay? Think about it. But yeah, so we are going to get kind of into some of those symbolisms later on and some of those concepts and things like that. But um symbolically we as a people have those traditions and customs that we pass down from mouth to ear from person to person okay but some of us kind of ignored it some of us embraced it uh i'm kind of both i kind of think about okay you're doing too much over here or i understand the tradition i understand why our schools our hbcus and black churches and black colleges were uh, put together because we needed our own traditions in place to make us feel whole again, to make us feel well again. All right. You can disagree with me if you want to. You can agree to disagree, or whatever. But you know, hey, I'm for a good argument. All right. But <laughs> but yes, um, the Nile River Valley culture influenced the old world, but it we have to understand it is an African culture first. All right. It's an African culture first. It is not uh, European culture or Phoenician culture that just so happened to land, migrate further in Africa. It started in the center and southern part of Africa, and then it moved up the Nile. Okay? All right. But, you know, let's continue, right? Significant and political... Oh, my spelling is bad. Political culture influence. Let me fix that because, I, you know, I can't stand bad spelling. Let me fix that real quick because I don't like that at all. Uh, my 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 children, my students will wear me out if they see this one. But you know, I'm so excited about this information. I had to I had to get it done, right? But while I'm doing this, shout out to the fam in all over the diaspora. Shout out to the fam in Brazil, in Saudi Arabia, in Texas. We just enjoyed Juneteenth festivities, all those wonderful things. I'm just happy that we had it and we did it. And shout out to the fam in California. 
<laughs> Whoa. Uh, shout out to the fam California, New York. Oh, God. Um, South Africa, Nigeria, Cameroon, the Hausa family, the Bambara family, uh, Dominican Republic family. Shout out to all you guys in Germany, in Switzerland that are listening. I really appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, paying attention and even we are learning together we're doing this together and i really appreciate that so uh but let's continue with to the bit with the business but shout out to all the fans don't forget to like comment subscribe and all those wonderful things but yeah all right here we go i fixed it <laughs> significant political uh political and cultural influence the greeks also said that the egyptians derived their their civilization and religion from ethiopia It just didn't start from just out of nowhere. Once again, I'm going I'm to hit this ace card one more time. There it is. Egyptian religion was not an original conception, according to Sister Houston. This was not an original thought where out of the uh, out of the blue, they just said, hey, we're going to have um, the pyramids. We're going to have the Tekkenen or and all these these uh, the meta nature, all those things. They, they just. It just didn't happen overnight. It happened over time. And it, it was one of those things where, say, for example, your grandmother, who you love, my grandma, I love her, both grandmothers, uh, passed down information to their sons, their daughters, and then they gave it to you. That's how it is. Okay? But we have to understand, this was a longer period of time. This was a longer span of time. Okay? thousands upon thousands of years okay it just got better and better okay and that's what we should do make things better don't just keep things as they are right so yeah so ethiopia taught was the grandmother of egypt of kemet all right let's go all right now egypt was a colony of Ethiopia. I'm a this book is dated. Okay? That for the lack of a better word, they didn't just in a sense as we see say George Washington and them. No. This they 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 gave birth to it, they developed it. But now I'm gonna say this though. Okay, there were some kings that threw hands that that developed the pre-dynastic period. King Narmer, his father, the Scorpion King. Shout out to uh, Brother Mo. Uh, we're going to talk about the Scorpion King uh, one of these days. We're going to get to it. All right. But they they had to come in with their, their people and they threw hands. The best man won. United these 42 gnomes as a nation. It had to happen. Okay. There were many, there were several different, I'm learning that uh, in studying Nubia and Kush, there were several um, various groups in that area. Same culture. But it was like, think about this, uh, the neighborhoods of your city. Okay, in Dallas, there's quite a few neighborhoods, but they're in the same place. Okay, we have East Dallas, we have Pleasant Grove, we have Oak Cliff. We have uh, Keystone Polk. We have uh, in Fort Worth. We have Stop Six. We have all these places, right? And then South Dallas is in the middle of Dallas, right? All these places. All right. Shout out to the fam. But they had to be there. And and even in that, when I think about it, think about your own town. Right now, matter of fact, shout out your town in the comments. But think about your town. Some of your cities are pretty large. And even in that space, they can be diverse. And some of you guys look alike. But it's how you wear clothes or how you talk. and It differentiates you. It's not a bad thing. It's just part of the culture, right? All right. So Egypt was a colony of Ethiopia. And the laws and scripts of both lands were naturally the same. They all had the same rules and regulations. They follow a concept of Ubuntu or Ma'at. They follow that. Okay? If you take my cow, something's going to happen. Or you owe me a cow. Or some chickens or something. Reciprocity. Respect. Okay? Yeah. 
So the hieroglyphic writing of the Meta Nature was known to the people of Ethiopia. So it was not just this this writing, this language <clears throat> was not just an Egyptian thing. This was an African thing. Just like Wolof or Yoruba, Swahili is known to various uh, countries and states in Africa. The Meta Nature was known to various people in Africa. Okay. Now, they may take out a word or two, but that was how they talked. That's how they communicate. There was a unifying language uh, for the people. All right. Now, let's go. Let's continue. In Greek times, Ethiopians depicted Ethiopia. Uh, well, the, I'm sorry. Ethiopians depicted Ethiopia as an ideal state. I'm sorry. The Greeks did. The Romans did. It's an ideal state. In those days, the central seat of Ethiopia was not the Meroe of our day, which is very ancient, but the kingdom that preceded that in, in many ages that is called Meru. So there was an older civilization, older than Meroe, called Meru, according to Sister Houston. It goes back. It goes further. Okay, and so they, they, the Greeks wrote about these places. The Romans wrote about these places, or they heard about them. Like we said, the, the the seat of power, the seat of influence was older than was written, All right? A little bit more. Ancient traditions told in the deeds of Diva uh, Nasha, uh, Nasha Kings of Maru. Okay, one of the poems uh, of Taking the Troy was called the, the Etiop or Etiops. Why? Because the warriors were the Kushite uh, Ethiopians. They were not European. So when you hear about the taking of Troy, you know, we see a lot of Uzungus with swords and whatnot. No, it looked like these people over here. It looked like they were a little bit darker. Okay. Than some of your famous people that you see in Hollywood. Okay. Portraying these people. They were the warriors. Okay. They were the ones. Okay. And so the conf and this version, get this, y'all. The version of this story. Of Troy, okay, this version was presented the, the conflict as an Egyptian war. It was not a Greco Roman or Greece and Athens. Uh, this is Sparta 300 type thing. This was another one of those things called the Nile River War. We need to talk about that. Okay, this. I want to see this. I want to really, uh, this sparked another idea, the Nile River War. Okay, to uh, basically an attempt to save the soul of Kemet. Hmm. Let's talk about that. Modern books contain, I'm, I'm reading here, this is page 30, y'all. Uh, modern books contain but little information about country of Upper Nile but archaic books are full of the story of the wonderful Ethiopians. They may not talk much about the Nile, but they will say something about the Ethiopians. The ancients said that they settled Egypt and they was occupying the Blue Nile. Okay. Now he called that the Red Sea area and that side towards Yemen, Ethiopia proper. And African Africa contains, I read 31, contains a greater number of them and a considerable tract in, in Asia was occupied by this race. So a lot of people say uh, Asia this and European that. That's fine. But before all of this, the Ethiopian Empire occupied that space. All right. And in the Persian period, Ethiopia was an important and independent state. We're going to get into the politics, the political significance. They had not just cultural power where they had gold, they had these things, they had the meta nature, they had all these wonderful things. They held political power. What they say, it went. Whatever the Ethiopians said, goes. Whatever the Kushite people said, goes. Okay? And so, and the, the researchers talked about Shabaka and Taharka, okay, the Ethiopian kings who sat on the throne of Egypt. Not that some people call them the black kings. Kemetic kings were black too. I'm just saying. But 
Taharka and Shabaka. Taharka right here and Shabaka right, uh, on the right, they held political power. They weren't just, just figureheads now, like, like how we have nowadays and some of our politicians and people that that sit in these seats and they um somebody put them there. No, they earned their right to be there and they ruled accordingly. Yeah. We need to look into those Kushite kings and queens, the Kandik, the queens that 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 had the elephants and they threw hands and they said, no, you're not going to come here with that. But they had political power. Whatever they wrote on paper, whatever the scribes wrote on their behalf, that was law. Come on, leaders. Okay. And, and somebody asked a question about a good leader. What is a good leader? A good leader may not always go with what you want them to do. A leader will lead for the uh, for the well being of everybody, right? And so, and some people think a leader is only a good leader if they're following them. That's not a good leader. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, all right, <laughs> let's go. Now, what happened to the Kushite priesthood? Priesthood after a series of invasions and a lack of understanding, the priests moved back south. Okay, they went back to the heart of knowledge. Okay, Abu Simbel was in Nubia. Fight come with it. They moved Abu Simbel right when the Aswan Dam was built. Check it out. But Abu Simbel was in Nubia. Okay, and the and these temples are in these temples are in in Nubia right now. Okay, they still exist, still monuments of power, monuments of knowledge. We need to study those. Okay. And so and so we have to understand that a lot of the priests realize that these people that are in that are in Egypt now aren't for the information. These people kind of move differently, these people are starting to act differently. We're going to have to withdraw. Remember, remember the Ethiopians and the Kushite people built a lot of the original monuments there. So the original knowledge that they had was starting to be watered down, started to be diluted. They said, no, you're doing something different. And this is, we're not talking about the golden ages. We're talking about towards the end. We're talking about towards the end, y'all. We're not talking about when the pyramids were made. We're not talking about when, see, the um, uh, uh, I mean, Hotep and uh, and many others rose to power. We're talking about towards the end after Ramses the Third, where it got funny. All right, when uh when Cleopatra and them start to show up, I said, "Nah, we we out." Okay, so. With the withdrawal, uh, I'm reading in page 32, with the withdrawal of the Ethiopian priesthood from Egypt to Napata, the people of the Lord now lost the sense of the real meaning of their religion, which steadily de deteriorated with their language after the separation from Ethiopia. Once you sever con once you sever your connection from your mother, that's an issue. That's a problem. Okay. And so not only the priesthood left, the military power left. Okay? Shout out to um, to a lot of the elders, uh, Ansuar Kwesi and many others who talk about the Magi. And the Magi was the military backbone of the Nile River Valley. Yes, Egypt had a standing military, but their strong power came from Nubia. And they, they said, look, we out too. Okay? So they did have allies in Libya and many others, but as, remember, the old race, the old race of Ethiopia uh, was starting to withdraw from Kemet. Okay? We know why, but we're not going to get into the reasons why, but, you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. But it's up to us to to study and to take up that information and to pass it down and make sure 
that the uh, generations behind us know what we're doing, why we're doing it, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Okay? Let's go. So, what's next? We're going to discuss chapter three. We're going to discuss chapter three. And, you know, for more on ancient Kush, check out Yaki Ashabaka. He's on. He's great. And Sister Danita Smith, she's awesome. Much love to the fam. And there's some more books, Ancient uh, American, I'm sorry, Ancient African Civilization, Kushanism, Black Genesis by Robert Bouval, which is great. Temples and Tombs, Ancient uh, Nubia, Prehistoric Nations. And you just you just got to listen to King Cam and Jumbe podcast. And I really appreciate you guys for listening and paying attention. And you just heard chapter two of Old Ethiopia and its people. And I will talk to you later.